let's move on then to the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture. Now, um, in most systematic theology textbooks, the inspiration of Scripture falls under another overarching category, which is the authority of Scripture. Right? Um, so usually, um, and I believe that Grudem differs here. Grudem has an entire chapter on authority of Scripture, but also an entire chapter on the inspiration of Scripture, um, which is very helpful. And he goes into it. So this is where Grudem is going to really serve you all, is that he, he's been informed by modern discussions, whereas Bavink, because of when he lived, uh, isn't, right? Uh, Grudem is being informed by the Chicago Statement, which you all will read about and learn about, um, which has defined what people mean by inerrancy amid different um, views of uh, scriptures, infallibility, and inerrancy. Um, this was a conversation that, um, especially in the 90s and 2000s, um, people were using the words infallibility, inerrancy, and it became pretty clear that not everyone meant the same thing when they said it. Um, and a lot of the guys who would say infallibility versus inerrancy would actually have a lower view of uh, of scripture than the guys who would say inerrancy, right? Uh, lower view from the inerrancy guy's perspective. Um, Grudem is going to speak into all of that in ways that Baving's not, um, explaining the, the historical backdrop for it and things like that. Um, what Bavink is going to uh, emphasize for you um, is what we're going to emphasize in this class, uh, which is more of the, the reasoning behind inspiration. Uh, the reasoning behind inspiration, um, what it has meant historically um, in response to the Catholic Church, um, and where we get the idea of inspiration as a whole, and not as much responding to modern trends. Um, so the, the origin of the term inerrancy comes from 2 Timothy 3, 16. Okay? All scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. God. Um, so Jerome, in the fourth century, compiled the Latin Vulgate um, to, in order to make the Bible readable to the masses who spoke Latin and not Greek. Um, with that, uh, the word inspiration uh, came to be. Um, so what I mean by that is spire, Right, spire meaning to breathe, um, uh, is uh, is Latin. So the the entire the term inspiration inspiration comes from the Latin uh, word to breathe. Okay, um, so inspiration then means at its core that the Bible is breathed out by God. That's what inspiration means. Inspiration means the Bible is breathed out by God. The Bible is inspired by God, meaning it's breathed out, okay? Now, why is that important? Because when I say uh, inspiration in normal English communication, what do you think of when I say inspiration? What's that? Yeah, it motivates you. Good, yeah. I was inspired by this TikTok to start working out every day. I was inspired by this blog post to uh, start waking up at uh, 5 a.m. You know, that, that kind of stuff. That's what people talk about, right? Any other ideas of how it's commonly used? That's what I think of. Maybe I would, that painting is inspiring to me. Not that it inspires me to do something, but I, I, it's, it's more describing the effect that it has on me. Um, it's inspiring. It, it kind of, it elevates me is, is the feeling, right? Um, when I see that, that famous painting, that famous work of art. Maybe I read poetry. You know, I find poetry by this person inspiring, right? It uplifts me, right? Um, if, if we don't understand the history of this term, um, then what we're going to find is that we don't really understand uh, what, what we're talking about by the doctrine of inspiration. No, we don't mean by that that it is inspiring uh, or that it has inspired or it has an effect on me um, then it's not, it's not a quality then. Inspiration is not a quality either of the biblical authors, 
right? We're not saying that the biblical authors were inspired by God, meaning that they were motivated. Like, you know, you, you're on TikTok and that random video comes up with that guy with the big muscles and he just starts screaming at you. Why are you still in bed at 3 a.m.? I've been up for 17 hours. It's like, geez, dude, calm down. But, you, but something in you is like, okay, I'm inspired by that. I need, to, I need to fix my diet. I need to work out. I need to wake up at 3 a.m. Right? The, the biblical authors didn't hear from the Holy Spirit like that guy. Um, like, why have you not written the Bible yet? It's not like that, right? Uh, and then they went and did it. Um, rather, um, it's a quality of the text. Okay, inspiration then is not a quality of the reception of the text. It's not a quality of the authors. It's a quality of the text itself. So it's not, it's not an experience that either the authors have or that we have. It's a quality of the text, which is why the, the history is so important here. The text is breathed out by God. The text is inspired, meaning it's breathed out by God. Okay. So, so the question then, the question of inspiration is not a question of what's the experience of writing the Bible like. Uh, it's not a question of what's the experience of hearing from God like. It's not a question of what does it feel like to read the Bible. The question of inspiration then comes down to what is the relationship between the biblical author and the divine author. Right? What's the relationship between the biblical author and the divine author? If the text is breathed out by God, if the text is inspired, um, then what's the relationship between the pen being held by Paul and the text? What's the relationship between Paul's hand and the pen, even we could say? Um, when God chose to communicate through words, he chose to communicate through individuals. When we say that the text was breathed out by God, when we say that the text was inspired by God, what we what we're not saying is that it dropped out of heaven, right? The means by which it happened was that holy men of God were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Our holy men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God wrote written words through human authors, as, but human authors really did write. Human authors really did speak. So in what way... Do their ideas and do their words relate to God's ideas and God's words? That's the question of inspiration. Does that make sense? Just to lay the groundwork? Yeah. I mean, we just spent like 10 minutes of me saying, here are the 12 things that it's not, right? Because when people hear inspired, um, they don't think what I just said. <laughs> they think something very different. Um, yeah, I, so I'm, I'm open to the idea of it, uh, but I've never thought about it. Like, what, is there a better word? That, that's, why, so that's why it says breathed out by God. The King James, let's just look at the King James Version. I believe the King James says inspired. Yeah, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right? Um, so they're taking, they're taking from, the, uh, from the Latin there. Yeah, it's, it's inspired. Right? It's inspired by God. Um, it's breathe, which means it's breathed out by God. So, so in English, it's really coming from the King James translation of, of 1 Timothy 3.16. Um, we can look and see. Uh, so ESV artists saw that. CSB is all scriptures inspired. Interesting, the CSB says inspired by God. They're, try, they're, they're trying to connect it to the doctrine of inspiration. NIV, all scripture is God breathed. Um, the message says it's God breathed. Uh, Nasby says inspired. Lexham says God breathed. So they kind of go back and forth. That's really interesting. Very interesting. Okay, let's talk about it. So, so where do we start? Okay, where do we start when we talk about the doctrine of inspiration? So inspiration. So that's why. It, we're talking about the connection between authority of Scripture. Um, it goes under the category of authority oftentimes because what, what it's in reference to is its divine origin, which is where we're going next. Yeah, what was the question? Uh, it, the, the Greek says, the, uh, it's right here. You can read it. The, uh, let, me, let me zoom it in so you can see it because I... You're able to pronounce it now. 
Thea pnu eustas. Actually, you now know it's u, right? Because epsilon, upsilon is a diphthong, which you guys just learned, which says u, right? Thea pnustas. Thea pnustas. Thea coming from theos, God. Pnu coming from pneuma, spirit or breath. It's God breath. All scripture is God breath. That's what it says. So the question then is, what's, what does that mean? What does that mean in regards to the content of scripture? And especially, so if it is God breath, um, what was the experience of John or Paul or even Moses? Moses is sitting in a desert, right? He's been wandering for 40 years. John is on the island of Patmos, exiled, you know, spending the last days of his life alone. And he's just writing down. What's the, what's the relationship between the experience of, of Moses sitting in the desert writing and God breathing it out? That's the question of inspiration. Very good question. So, so where do we start? So here's the trend in modern theology. The trend in modern theology is to start with the human authors and then work our way to the divine author. Okay, to start with the human authors and then work our way to the divine author. So that what they say, with they're talking about the quality of the text, um, they start with the fact that humans are fallible, and then they work their way to uh, the divine author. So if humans are fallible, then Scripture must have errors in it. Right? If humans are fallible, then Scripture must have errors in it. The, the problem with that is that that's not where Scripture starts. Scripture doesn't start with the human author. Scripture start with, starts with the divine author, right? So it does the opposite. So Scripture starts with the fact that God breathed it and then moves to human author. Um, the same is true in 2 Peter 1.21. No prophecy was produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God, right? So that the divine author is far more in mind than the human author in the scripture writing process. So to start with men and then move to God is an artificial category that scripture doesn't place on itself. So we shouldn't either. That's number one. That's problem number one with, uh, is that people tend to do this and not the other. The second problem is assumptions that human fallenness and human feebleness and human limitations somehow limits God. That, that because humans are like this, God is unable to make Scripture be without errors or make Scripture be without problems, right? We're starting with the human and then working to the divine. We have all kinds of problems. Third and final problem, the conclusion of this line of thinking is that God doesn't actually accomplish his goal in Revelation, which is to reveal. Revelation must actually reveal if it is to be revelation. So... Thea pneustas. It's God breathed. It's breathed out by God. So here's what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God breathed into the writings to elevate them. Okay? So it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't mean that humans wrote something and God breathed into it and made it somehow better. That's not how the scripture accounts for it. Rather, the idea of breathed out by God is likely a reference to Moses originally. Moses is the mouthpiece of God. So that as Moses spoke, the words were actually divine words. So here's, here's our definition of, um, of inerrancy. This is from Jeff Perswell. It is the superintendence of the Holy Spirit. The superintendence of the Holy Spirit over the writers of Scripture. The superintendence of the Holy Spirit over the writers of Scripture. Such that their writings are an accurate record of revelation given them by God. The superintendence of the Holy Spirit 
over the writers of Scripture such that their writings are an accurate record of the revelation given them by God, possessing full divine authority and trustworthiness. Possessing full divine authority and trustworthiness. I'll say it again. The superintendence of the Holy Spirit over the writers of Scripture, such that their writings are an accurate record of the revelation given them by God, possessing full divine authority and trustworthiness. So the question, the question of inspiration comes down to, like I said, the, what is the relationship between the divine speech and the human speech? Um, the, it's the question of the mode of inspiration. What's the mode, okay? What is the mode of inspiration? Now, there is a bit of mystery here because the Bible doesn't answer this question directly. Right? The Bible does not tell us uh, the psychology of the biblical authors as they were writing. The Bible doesn't tell us what their experience was right. It simply says that it's breathed out by God. Um, the Bible is more interested than in the origin of Scripture. Okay? It's more interested in the origin of Scripture than the psychology of inspiration. Uh, it tells us the Holy Spirit carried men along as they wrote, but it doesn't detail how they were carried along or what it felt like to be carried along or what happened to their hand and the pen on the page as they were carried along. Uh, but we can make reasonable conclusions from Scripture. Okay? We can make certain reasonable conclusions from Scripture. So I'd like to give us a few different views here. Um, first is the dict dictation view. The dictation view. Um, so, I, I like to call this the speech-to-text view. The speech-to-text view. Um, you know how on your phone, if you want to write a text message, you can just hit the, that microphone icon or whatever it looks like on your phone, and you just talk into it. And whatever you say, it's supposed to be 100% what's written. You know, sometimes it'll get the word wrong. Um, sometimes it'll get it right. Um, I'm not sure what the term is like. Sometimes I'll, I'll go like months and Siri will be 100% accurate. And then every once in a while, Siri will just go into this tailspin of, of not being accurate at all. For, again, for months, Siri has ups and downs, apparently. <laughs> but, but the idea is that what, what basically it's, a, it's, it's an overriding of the human will an overriding of the human experience even, um, so that, now transfer that speech to text into uh, um, writing, so that in a sense the human authors go into a trance even. Um, they're, they're not self-aware. They're not even aware of what the process is. This is a bit of a silly, uh, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but that they, they would close their eyes and out comes Romans. Um, so much so that um, the, the divine will, the divine vocabulary, the divine uh, action is, uh, is not only primary, but the only thing that's happening, right? Um, so that um, the authors wrote words down uh, as God dictated them, uh, word for word, leaving the human authors completely passive agents in the process. Um, an example from bygone eras has not been the speech-to-text view, but that God is like a flute player, and the prophets are just the flutes, and the notes come out, right? Or a guitar player, and the humans are the guitar, and the notes come out. Um, so that there's, there's, the humans are completely passive uh, as this is happening. There, there are some problems with this. Um, it does seem, this does seem to account for some portions of Scripture, um, like Exodus 34, which we already saw, that, that God's finger actually wrote the Ten Commandments, right? Or Revelation chapters 2 and 3, in which Jesus himself said specific words and John wrote them down, right? Um, but it do, here's what it doesn't account for. It doesn't account for different styles from different authors. So you'll find this... I mean, you can see this in English a bit, but as you read Greek more and more, uh, John has a very different style than Paul, and Luke has a very different style than Peter, right? 
They're very different stylistically. That's, that's not even to mention the Old Testament, um, comparing Moses to David or Jeremiah to Solomon. Their Hebrew reads very different. Um, the style of their writing, but not, not just the style of their writing, um, their, um, the, their theological emphasis in their writing, right? Um, so that why, why does Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and John record different events or different events with different emphasis um, or sometimes details in different ways? There's a theological motivation behind all of that. Um, so that Matthew is writing with a different theological emphasis than Luke is, right? Um, however, if it's all coming directly from a single divine mind such that uh, the humans are merely passive agents, you would expect to see much more uniformity. You'd expect just to see God's writing style, not anything else. Um, the other problem is that it, it removes the human element entirely, okay? Look at... Look at 2 Peter 1.21, men spoke from God, but men spoke. Men did speak, right? Um, there is actually a sense in which we can say there's, there is a, a, a rightly understood human element to Scripture, and it's an authentic human element. There's an authentic human element to Scripture. Uh, finally, then it also, it also tends to detach Scripture from, it, from its historical and cultural setting. There were cultural concerns, there were historical concerns that were motivating the biblical authors as they did speak. So this doesn't seem to best account for the data. Uh, so that's number one. The second is the illumination view. The illumination view. Um, so this, this would say inspiration does not include communication from God. Inspiration does not include communication from God, but it's a divine activity, okay, in which the natural giftings of people are elevated, and, and the author's ability to perceive truth and insight into things are heightened, and they're elevated, right? So, so, um, so then inspiration is not, it's not a product of the scriptures, it's a it's, a, it's an act in which God takes Paul, and where Paul, Paul might just be, you know, your average bloke if you heard him preach in the synagogue one day, or heard him preach at church on Sunday. But then, but then when he sits down at his desk, he can tell there's an experience, a bit of a, a rushing in of the Holy Spirit, that all of a sudden, uh, his, his natural writing ability is just lifted up, like crazy high, Right? Um, his, his ability to remember the Old Testament is just empowered to, a, to an unusual degree so that, you know, he might be playing, he might be playing, um, you know, life in, in regular mode, um, but uh, he's, he's elevated in writing so that he, can, he could beat it in God mode if he wanted to, right? He's, he's able to do anything, uh, in a sense. What's the problem here? Can you think of one? Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16 again. What's that? Yeah, you would think they wouldn't really be God's words. It's, yeah. Yeah. They're 100% human words in that sense, aren't they? Where is it placing inspiration? In the author, right? Not in the writings themselves. Um, it's... Inspiration is something that God does to the person in this view and not to the writing. That's the problem. So that it's, it's all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. That's what inspiration is. Inspiration is not um, a quality of the author. Inspiration is a quality of the text itself. Next is the illumination view. I'm sorry, we just did that. Next is the dynamic view. The dynamic view. Um, which this says that the Spirit gave human authors ideas to write about. Okay, so, so the Spirit might come to Paul one day and say, Hey, you should write about adoption. Or, Hey, Paul, you should write about election. And then he says to John, hey, John, what have you wrote about how God is love 
and light and wrote about fellowship with God. And then, you know, he came to Peter and said, hey, Peter, uh, what have you wrote about this? And to Moses, hey, hey Moses, what about this idea? Um, so that uh, he gives the authors ideas, but complete freedom in how to express those ideas. Right? So, so he ends it with the idea, Paul, what if you wrote about adoption? Um, Paul, there's this controversy in Corinth. Uh, you should write um, some chapters about uh, spiritual gifts and about submission to leadership and, and not having divisions, and you should write about church discipline. So the Spirit is coming to the authors and inspiring them to write about certain things, but they're given complete freedom in how to write it and how to express themselves. What's the issue there? Yeah, there certainly could be error, right? There certainly could be error. Again, though, inspiration is a quality in this view of the author and not of the text. Right? That he's, he's giving an idea to the author, what if you wrote about this, instead of it being a, 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 a quality of the text itself. Okay, I want to give one more f- what I believe to be wrong views, and then I'll give what I believe to be the right view. Lastly is the encounter view. The encounter view. Um, so this, is, this would say that inspiration isn't something that happened to produce Scripture. Inspiration has nothing to do with the production of Scripture or the origin of Scripture or the divine relationship to the text that we have. Rather, God chooses to speak through Scripture, right? So God speaks sometimes to Scripture. So revelation occurs as people encounter God in Scripture. So the Bible isn't revelation, but, but God can be revealed in and through the Bible when he chooses to breathe through the Bible and to speak through the Bible. That would be this view. What's the problem with that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all Scripture is breathed out by God. And we already said it's, it's, an, it's, it's breathed out by God. It's not God breathing. Right? We spent quite a while on that. Who, who do you think would be a fan of this view that we talked about already? Bart. Bart. Yeah, this is exactly right. Karl Bart. It locates, once again, inspiration not in the text, but in the event now of hearing it. So all of these errors, all of these errors, well, most of them, that we've seen, are the, their biggest problem is that they're not, they're not paying attention to what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, which is that inspiration is a quality of the text. It's not a quality of the person who is hearing the text. It's not a quality of the author as they write the text. It's a quality of the text itself. It, it also, it doesn't account for Peter's reasoning that Scripture is more reliable than seeing Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Peter's whole reasoning behind, and we've already looked at this, 2 Peter 1, 21, is that we have the Word of God more fully confirmed. If It doesn't make sense, then, if, if one is potentially a speech and one is actually a speech. Uh, I would take the actually a speech over the potentially a speech any day of the week. Um, so then the final view, the one that uh, our statement of faith affirms, um, is the organic view. The organic view. Um, this is the reformed view. This was Calvin's view. This is Baving's view. Um, within Calvinist traditions, this is, this is the view that you'll see consistently. And I think it best accounts for the biblical data and it best accounts for um, what the text is uh, as we read it. So I want to give us three quotes that will help us. So the first is from Bavink. He defines inspiration this way. The activity of the Holy Spirit in the writing process, after all, consists in the very fact that having, been pre- had, had having prepared the human consciousness consciousness of the authors in various ways. He's preparing the humans by birth, upbringing, natural gifts, research, memory, reflection, experience, life, uh, revelation. So he's preparing them 
throughout all of their lives. He now, in and through the writing process itself, made those thoughts into words. That language style rise to the surface of the consciousness which could best interpret divine ideas for the person of all sorts of rank and class or every nation and age. What, what's he saying there? He's, he's saying that the whole of the person's life led to the moment of inspiration, right? So that Paul, right? Paul is born. He has a certain upbringing. He's read even certain passages of Scripture more regularly in his private devotions, right? And he's asked certain questions throughout all of his life. He's had different encounters with other people throughout all of his life. So that when he sits down to write the book of Romans, it's, it's fully a product of every experience that he's had throughout all of his life. And it's fully a product of what God intends to have written. Okay, let me read Warfield. Um, he says this, If Paul wished to give, I'm sorry, if God wished to give his people a series of letters like Paul's, he prepared a Paul to write them. And the Paul he brought to the task was a Paul who would spontaneously write just such a letter. Let me read frame. Organic inspiration means that God used all the distinct personal qualities of each writer. God used the differences of hereditary, environment, upbringing, education, gifts, talents, styles, interests, and idiosyncrasies to reveal his word. These differences were not a barrier that God had to overcome. Rather, they were God's chosen means of communicating with us. God's word is complex and nuanced and multi-perspectival. God used the organic complexities of human persons and the diversities among the persons to communicate the complexity of his word. He used human persons to communicate with us in a fully personal way. Does that make sense? So in that sense, it's inspiration is a quality of the text, but we have a view of the sovereignty of God over the entirety of the person's life, right? So it matters that Luke was a doctor, and Paul was a former Pharisee, and James is the brother of Jesus, and Peter was a fisherman, right? All of those life experiences, God is sovereignly orchestrating, so that at the moment they write down the words, they are God's very words, the very words God wants. Uh, in that sense, it, it's a much bigger view of inspiration. It's, it's inspiration is a quality of the text, right? They are the words that God breathed out in the moment. But it's a view of inspiration that reaches down to the fact that, you know, it's a bit of a silly example, but little details in their life so that when Paul was a little boy and he ran around and scraped his knee, and Rabbi so-and-so came to him and said, don't you remember what Moses said, and quotes Moses to him, and Paul feels comforted. Perhaps Paul has a memory like that, that comes to the surface as he's writing the text, right? And God orchestrated all of those events, so in the moment of writing it down, um, God is bringing those memories to mind, so that the very words are God's words itself as they're being written. Yeah. Yeah, he's sovereign over all things, right? Everything, everything that happens. So it depends on what you mean by micro. So micromanage is a negative word, right? So I'm using the word sovereignty. And I'm saying that it's not special for them in a way that it's not for us, right? God is sovereign over all things so that not a hair falls from our head apart from his will, right? Micromanage is a very, micromanage is a very different, a, a, a negative word. I'm, I'm just saying that God is exercising his sovereignty over their lives in the same way he does in everyone's life. Let me, let me give you some benefits. There's three, three benefits I'd like to give you, then we can take some questions. So number one, um, it makes appropriate allowances for the human side of scripture without undermining the divine side. It makes appropriate allowances for the human side of scripture without undermining the divine side. Number two, it views inspiration as the culmination of a process and not merely just an instantaneous moment of insight or influence or losing consciousness as the pen just moves on the page. Number three, it views inspiration in a way consistent with a broad range of activities of the Holy Spirit. 
The, the Holy Spirit is the author of all human skill. And inspiration um, is a moment in which the Holy Spirit is... Uh, the, in, the, inspiration is both a quality of the text, a quality of the text as it's being written, it's being breathed out by God. But, but in that sense, you could say that all of the Holy Spirit's activities and all of God's activities in that person's life up to that moment, um, in some sense, could be included in the idea of inspiration, right? So that everything, everything that's happened, it makes sense that Paul would write that letter. The Holy Spirit doesn't overcome a person. The Holy Spirit doesn't overcome a person so that what they write are the words of God. Rather, they, they are personally writing, um, and those words are the words of God. Again, so with, here's with that, okay? I, this is how I started this lecture. There's mystery here. Because here's what the Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't tell us about the psychology of David as he wrote Psalm 23. I don't know what David was feeling. I don't know what, how the chemicals in his brain were firing. I don't know what emotional experience David was having. I have no clue. Did, did he feel like, as he was writing Psalm 23, oh, this is very different than the other ones? I doubt it. But maybe the Bible doesn't tell me. But the Bible does tell me that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Right? So in some sense, it's a very human process but it has divine origin. So, again, we started with this. We're not doing this. We're not starting with the humans and working our way to God. We're saying that it is a product of God breathing it out. But we are doing a bit of speculating at this point, trying to figure out what that experience was like. Does that make sense? The result, then, is that Scripture's completely, whatever the psychological experience behind the writing of Scripture was, the divine origin means that it's without errors. Whatever the human psychological or emotional or physiological experience was behind it, um, the fact that it's breathed out by God means that it is without errors. We start with God and then move to the people. Any questions on that? Yeah. I think that all errors in what, in what inspiration is come down to a misreading of, oh, well, not all, most, <laughs> come down to a misreading of 2 Timothy 3.16. So it says that Scripture is breathed out by God, right? So that's the pen on the page is breathed out by God. Um, so that's, it's not a quality of the authors. It's not even a quality of the apostles. So that when an apostle spoke, sometimes he spoke inspired things and sometimes he didn't. Right, it's not. It's not like the apostles were like the pope. Right, and so, at least the the text. The text is far more concerned um, when it talks about inspiration. Or this is the only text that talks about inspiration, right? In in the traditional sense. But this text in Second, second Peter one twenty one is talking about the writing process, not just a quality of the individual. Not a quality of the individual. So it's different than their authority as an apostle. Yeah, so for instance, um, um, you know, to, Acts 5, to lie to an apostle is to lie to the Holy Spirit, right? Um, we already mentioned that. Um, Paul talks about other letters that he's written, which he seems to take as authoritative, right, um, for them uh, in the moment, right? That he says, I wrote to you before not to... Uh, associate with the sexually immoral. Now, what I didn't mean by that was the sexually immoral from this world. I meant the one who calls himself brother, right? So he's clearly doing other writings that he's asking them to hold on to. And that later on, he clarifies. Now, maybe he needs to clarify it because he didn't communicate clearly, right? Maybe he needs to clarify it because there were problems with it, right? But there aren't in First and Second Corinthians, and, and this, solves, this solves that issue, I think. Inspiration is a quality of the text. That this also, it solves the issue then of what would happen if we found 3 Corinthians. It, it wouldn't be inspired, right? We're not saying that everything Paul wrote is inspired or everything Paul said is inspired. We're saying that the text itself is inspired. Yeah. 
I think it has to do with the fact that they saw Jesus face to face, personally commissioned by Jesus, things like that. But, but the authority resides in the text because the text was spoken by God, right? But it's not like everything that Paul said was God speaking. I, actually, I, I think that this is, if Paul's sermons and Paul's, um, Paul's uh, letters carry equal authority, I think that's actually a lower view than what I'm proposing of Scripture. I'm saying that there was certain writings that God breathed as they were written that were different than Paul's regular Sunday morning preaching. And it's separated from his... It, it, it's, it's sourcing, then, inspiration in God as a quality of the text instead of sourcing in an individual who's just speaking. It's not starting from the human, then working the divine. It's starting from the divine, then working to the human. And it's a quality of the text and not the person. The Bible, the Bible is the most well-attested of all ancient documents. We have more manuscripts of the Bible than any other ancient document. Now that creates great confidence in what the text actually said. You know, because I have, what, what's, what's, what's better? So, so with that, we don't have any, we don't have the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans. We don't have the original manuscript, right? We do have copies of it. Very early copies, relatively very early copies. Now, if I have only one c copy of Romans, I'm really trusting that, that one copy is what Paul actually wrote. If I have two copies and I can compare them, then I have more confidence. If I have five copies and I can compare them, I have even more confidence. If I have a hundred copies of Paul's letter to the Romans and they all say the same thing, I have a lot of confidence, especially if some of them are in Egypt and some of them are in Rome and some of them are in Jerusalem, and some of them are in Galatia, and like they're kind of coming from a bunch of geographic locations, and they're all saying the same thing, now I'm really confident. You know what gives me even more confidence, actually? Is if they all say the same thing 99%, and a couple of them have the word order change, or a couple of them have a misspelling, or a couple of them have, you know, verse a longer version of chapter 1, verse 8, um, and 99 of them don't, that actually gives me a lot of confidence that that long version of the end of verse 1 is not original, because the other 99 don't say it. Um, so we have a lot of manuscripts, and the, the, the amount of manuscripts that we have give us a lot of confidence with what the text actually said. So there's, there's a couple criteria. Criteria number one is that the earlier manuscripts better, are better testimonies of what Paul actually said than the later manuscripts. So something, if I find something that's a thousand years later, I'm gonna trust that less than something that's 150 years later, because it's closer. Number two, if it's geographically closer to where Paul wrote it, I'm gonna trust it more than something that's geographically further. So if Paul wrote in Jerusalem, if Paul wrote in Ephesus, and I find a manuscript in Turkey, I'm gonna trust that more than one I find in Alexandria, Egypt, because it's closer. Because that means, that means it's probably was written by a scribe who was close to where it was written and not a scribe that was far away, right? Um, that somehow a manuscript came over and then this guy is trying his best to write it down when he's not actually connected, as connected to Paul. Um, so, all that to say, a lot of our earliest manuscripts do not include verses 19 to the end of the chapter, or John 8. Um, so I don't think it's part of the Bible. And in the 20th century, we discovered a ton of manuscripts. T like, like, comparing to the rest of church history, we discovered, I believe, more manuscripts in the 20th century than all the previous centuries combined. And you know what those manuscripts confirmed consistently that what the Bible said is what was really written? Right, um, with the exception of like John eight or the end of Mark sixteen, um, but those are gifts. Those are wonderful things. You know, those are gifts to us. They shouldn't make us doubt. They should give us a lot of confidence. Right? If I'm finding a thousand manuscripts and they're all saying the same thing that I thought, they are all saying what I thought they should say. 
That should give me a lot of confidence that the Bible, God has preserved his word. The question, so the Muslims think that God preserved his word by not allowing multiple textual traditions or multiple options for what this text actually said. That's how they think God preserved his word. Christians don't think that God preserved his, his word that way. Christians think that God preserved his word by giving us thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscripts so that we can compare all of them together. Right? So we're not doubting did God preserve his word. We're, actually, we're just asking the question, how did God preserve his word? Right? And what if God preserved his word in a way different than you thought? And what if this is actually the way that he chose to do it? So that's how Christians think through that. Yeah. But every word that is scripture, every word that Paul wrote was breathed out by God, to bring it back to the topic. So this is, so the inspiration is under the, the, the section on the origin of scripture. Okay. So we started our do- doctrine of revelation with the uh, God is a speaking God, right? That's the foundation of our doctrine of revelation. Um, but then our foundation of inerrancy is the origin, right? Which is uh, where first or second Timothy three sixteen places it. So all scripture is breathed out by God, being accurately delivered through various human authors by the inspiration and sovereign agency of the Holy Spirit. We therefore receive the 66 books of the Old Testament and New Testament as perfect, infallible, and authoritative word of God, with the fullness of revelation given in Christ and his complete, completed redemptive work. No new normative revelation will need be given until Christ returns. In its original manuscripts, the whole scripture and all its parts are inerrant, and we're going to get to that soon, without errors in all it affirms. Because there is one divine author behind scripture, We are also able to arrive confidently in a a harmonious doctrinal unity understanding of the whole. Furthermore, God in all his loving providence has determined to to preserve his word as pure and trustworthy throughout history, just as he guided the early church in discovering, do you hear my language from my lecture here? He He guided the early church in discovering and identifying the canon that he inspired discerning and identifying the canon he inspired. Okay, good. Any questions on inspiration? The point is, inspiration is a quality of the text. 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 All scripture is breathed out by God. The next question then gets to, so this is the question of the mode of inspiration. Um, the next question is, uh, what portion of Scripture is inspired? What portion of Scripture is inspired? Um, so there's, there's two views here, and we'll go over these much more quickly. Um, the first is partial inspiration. And, and we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, when we were talking about in 2 Timothy 316. It's the question of translating it. Uh, is it all scripture is breathed out by God or all breathed out scripture is profitable, right? That's, that's the question. And we already looked at this in the original at length. But um, in the academic versions of this, uh, the claims are that the ethical and the religious portions are inspired. The ethical and the religious portions are inspired. Um, and often, what's said is it's the ethical portions which align with modern uh, desires and modern ethics, right? So that, um, you know, Paul, Jesus is great when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's inspired scripture. But you know what's not? Wives submit to your husbands, slaves submit to your masters. Those aren't. Come now. Um, but, but the parts we like are, not, but not the parts that we don't like. Um, those aren't inspired. Th- that's like an academic version. Um, the popular version of this is this. Like, and no one would probably ever formulate it like this, and that's why I say it's the popular version. It's just what people tend to think. The Gospels are the most inspired, right? And in the Gospels, the red letters are far more inspired than the black letters, right? The ones that Jesus said. Um, and, then, and then 
after, so it's red letters, gospel, and then the New Testament, right? That's like, that's like where it's really at. Um, and then, yeah, the parts of the Old Testament that I really resonate with. You know, like Psalm 23, like that's got to be inspired because I, re- I really resonate with that. Um, the pro- what's the problem with both of these? Exactly. The authority resides in our preferences or our reception, right? Um, you, read, you read this part about God being a rock and God being steadfast, and you say, I like that. You read these portions of Canaanite genocide, and you say, icky. Um, no, that can't be inspired. Um, so, no. Um, this, the, the authority can't rest in us. It must rest in the text. Um, so then, the, the other view, um, opposed to partial inspiration, is plenary inspiration, uh, meaning all of it. All of it. All, all parts. P-L-E-N-A-R-Y. Plenary. Yeah, just meaning in totality. In totality, right? It's not, you could say the partial view and the totality view. Um, so so w- what is meant here is that all of Scripture is inspired by God. All of Scripture is inspired by God. Um, so that, um, the, all of the words that were said, all the words that were said, uh, were inspired by God. Um, so that, that then leads to the third question, um, about, and this relates to the mode Um, this kind of relates to what we said before, um, but the intensiveness of inspiration. The intensiveness of inspiration. There's really two views here. Uh, the first is personal inspiration, uh, meaning that the authors were inspired. Uh, and the second is verbal inspiration. So you'll, you'll hear people say uh, plenary verbal inspiration, plenary verbal inspiration, right? That's what you'll hear um, within the Reformed tradition. What that means is plenary means all of Scripture. Verbal means the document itself and not the author, right? It, verbal is in contrast to personal. It's not a quality of the author, it's a quality of the text. So then inspiration extends not just to the ideas of Scripture um, or the ideas of the author, but the very words themselves. The very words themselves. Let's look at two texts. Matthew 5.18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not one dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished, which is it's talking about the very letters themselves. Not the general idea, but the letters themselves. Every bit of it will not pass away. Um, also, Mark 12, 27. Um, so this is an interesting text, right? Um, Michael preached on this a couple of months ago, I think. The, um, the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection come to Jesus, and they're trying to disprove the resurrection. They're trying to make the resurrection look silly. And so they say, if a man is married to a woman, and the man dies, and someone else marries her, right? Who's, who will she be married to in the resurrection? And they say, well, let's make this a little more extreme. Let's say that she gets married to seven different men throughout her life, because they keep dying, right? I mean, this, this poor woman, right, in this silly analogy, right? Um, like, her husbands just keep dying one after another, and somehow she gets married to seven men. And they say... Who's she going to be married to in the resurrection? And what they're thinking is, got you. Of course there's no resurrection. And they're trying to make the resurrection look silly. And and Jesus responds by saying, no, I'm not silly. You're silly. Um, Don't you realize there's no marriage in the resurrection? There's no marriage in the resurrection. And then he goes a step further. So the Sadducees, the Sadducees did not believe that the entirety of the Old Testament was Scripture. 
only the first five books. Okay, so if you look outside the first five books, you have Daniel 12, right? You have Ezekiel 38, um, or sorry, 37, right? You have clear text that talk about a resurrection. Um, but if you're limited to the first five books, it makes it much harder to see a resurrection, right? But Jesus says, I can prove the resurrection from your books. Are you ready for it? When God, remember the story of the burning bush that you find authoritative? God said, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You're quite wrong. This is quite an interesting exegetical point Jesus is making. God does not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he drives from that the resurrection. If he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. Okay, so how does this fit into what we're saying here? Um, Jesus rests his entire argument on the tense of a verb. It's a present tense verb and not a past tense verb. And because it's a present tense verb, they are still alive. He rests the entire doctrine of the resurrection on the tense of a verb. That means we're not talking about individual ideas or the general, you read the text and it's the general idea of it. No, no, no. Down to the tense of the verb itself is what God intended to communicate. And you can trust down to the very verb tense. Um, So the Chicago statement, here's the the Chicago statement of errancy, which I believe Grudem has you, is in your reading. If it's on your reading, uh, you should read it. I'll give you extra credit for reading it. If it's not, I think it's in the back of Grudem, though. It says this in Article 6. We affirm the whole of Scripture, and all its part, down to the very word of the original, were given by divine inspiration. Notice it's sourcing in the words again. We deny that the inspiration of Scripture can be rightly affirmed of the whole without the parts, or some of the parts without the whole. Okay, do you hear that? They're saying down to the very words and all of it. That's verbal, plenary inspiration. Any questions on that? Yeah. So, typically, yeah, so inspiration is a quality of the text when they were originally written, right? So, um, if I, so, if I have the Bible next to me, and I write down, write it down, my copy's uninspired. Or, let's make it even more... Um, applicable. You guys, by the end of the year, will be translating um, massive chunks of 1 John. Not the whole book, but massive chunks of it. Your translation of 1 John is not inspired. Sorry. Uh, Inspiration also doesn't affirm that any time a first-year Greek student sits down to translate 1 John, uh, what he translates it into is inspired, right? So, copies, copies in as much as they say the same as the original, carry the authority of the original. Okay, copies in as much as they say the same thing as the original, carry the authority of the original, but they're not inspired. Inspiration is a product of the text. It's being breathed out by God as it's written down. Does that make sense? Yeah. How does the word of God reach its full effect Intended effect in the lives of God's people. So the intended effect of revelation is to bring people into a relationship with God. Um, Luther said this, the reading of the word of God alone is sterile. Only in the preaching moment does it reach its full efficacy. So that's, that's Luther, like sola scriptura man, right, who said that. Um... So what I'm not saying is the Bible is more the word of, or sorry, the preaching is more the word of God than the Bible. I'm not saying that. Don't quit the pastor's college. But I am saying, I, I do think there's something to what he's saying, that in the preaching moment, um, God chooses to bring, God chooses in the preaching moment to bring people into saving a relationship with him in a unique way. 
I do like a lot of what I do like a lot of what he says about preaching, and it's very informed by Calvin actually, um, which is why he's such a mixed bag. Um, but his doctrine of the Word of God, I think, is bad. But his 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 preaching books, if you read those, you'll be like, this is really good stuff. Um, and then other times you'll be like, this guy's wonky. Um, yeah, so I do think, I think that our services appropriately uh, place the preaching moment um, as the high point of the service. Um, the only thing that might combat that would be the, if we did weekly communion. <laughs> then that might be the high point of the service. Because this is what the disciples on the road to Emmaus said. Jesus was preaching to them and explained the text to them. And then when he broke the bread, they realized their hearts were burning within them in the preaching moment. They didn't even realize that their hearts were burning within them until he broke the bread. And that's when we have more questions. Yeah, what's up? So inspiration refers to the the writing of the text. It's breathed out by God. It's not, a, it's not a product of the reading of the text or the translation of the text. It's, it, ha, it, it's a, it's, it means to say the text has divine origin, and God breathed it out. So it's, it's more in reference to the writing of the text than anything else. So we said our inspiration, at the beginning of the lecture, we said it has more to do with the relationship between the divine author and the human author than anything else. So it's more talking about what happened in the moment of writing it down. What happened when the pen touched the page? What's happening in Paul's psyche than anything? That's more of what the conversation's about. This gets into the category of inerrancy, actually, I would say. So inspiration has more to do with the moment of the writing. Inerrancy has more to do with the authority um, and the, um, you know, does it have errors or not? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. But no, your translation of the Bible is not inspired. Um, ins inspiration refers to the moment in which the pen hit the page and it's being breathed out by God. Um, yeah. But it is inerrant, right? In, the, in as much as it affirms what the original documents say, it's inerrant. But inerrancy is more the category, I think, of what you're thinking of. Good. The inerrancy of Scripture. The inerrancy of Scripture. So here's the definition of the inerrancy of Scripture. Let me write this down. The inerrancy of Scripture. Um, this means Scripture contains no errors. And Scripture is incapable of erring. Scripture contains no errors, and it is incapable of erring. Again, we start that conversation, though, with the source. The source is not primarily men. The source is God. Men are the instrument through which God writes things down, but they are not the source. They're not the, men are not the source of any revelation. Men did actually speak, but... Revelation is a product of God. That's, I mean, what we're saying now is basically just application of what we've been saying all week, right? Revelation is something God does, not men. Therefore, the, do, the text itself is a product of God and not a product of men. Um, men just spoke as, God, as the Holy Spirit moved them along. Um, so we start with God then. We start with God, just like we did for inspiration. Um, it has no heirs and it's incapable of erring. Now, this is more of a theological argument than anything else, because it starts with God and Titus 1-2. God cannot lie. God never lies, right? If God never lies and Scripture is given to us by God, then God doesn't lie in Scripture, um, so, number one, it's incapable of errors because God does not lie. Number two, uh, it's incapable of errors because God is not ignorant of anything. God knows everything. So, Psalm 33, 13 through 15. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out at all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashioned the hearts of them all, he observes all their deeds. God sees everything, and God knows everything. He's not ignorant of anything, so he never lies, and he's not ignorant of anything. Third, because God's word is truth. 
Psalm 119.43. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. My hope is in your rules. Compare that with John 17, 17, where Jesus says the same thing. Your word is truth. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Okay, so number one, God doesn't lie. Number two, God knows everything. Number three, a quality of God's word is truth. And number four, because Christ, who is the center of Scripture, is truth. Because Christ, who is the center of Scripture, is truth. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Finally, and fifthly, because, as we already mentioned, the Word of God has and possesses the attributes of God. The word of God has and possesses the attributes of God. So God is righteous, therefore his word is righteous. God is holy, therefore his word is holy. God is powerful, therefore his word is powerful. Um, God is truth and God never lies, therefore his word is truth and his word never lies. Okay, so that's the doctrine of inerrancy. But then we have to, we have, to have the question, though, what constitutes an error? What constitutes an error, right? So we say, it, we say it has no errors, but then the harder question is not, does it err? The harder question is, if it, what do we mean by error? What constitutes an error? So historically, the question, this is what the question has had to do with, okay? Only in, in modern days has this been amplified a little bit. The question has to do with truthfulness versus falsehood. Truthfulness versus falsehood. Not precision versus error. Truthfulness versus falsehood, not precision versus error. Um, for instance, for instance, uh, Solomon, how old are you? You will be 27. How old are you right now? No, you're not. You're 26 and 11 months and 37 days and 12 hours and 37 minutes and 29 seconds. Solomon lied. Did you hear it? Six months out of the pastor's college. Right? No, Solomon did not lie, right? He, was, he wasn't as precise as he could have been, but he didn't lie, right? Um, so in, in human language, just asking someone their age, it doesn't mean that uh, if they don't have down to the very millisecond that they lied, okay. Um, you get, you, if you uh, tell a taxi driver where you're going, right, you tell them you're coming, if, you, if you're getting a, a taxi here, you tell them you're going to uh, Makanisa Abo, right, you're not going to the church, you're going to this area, right? You, you lied. You lied to him. You told him you were going to that church. You were going to Karma building. No. No, 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 no. Um, or maybe if I said, how many pages do you need to read for this class? And I said, it's, it's 300 pages. You've got to read 300 pages. You have to read 309 pages for this class. Josh lied. Josh is a liar. I knew it. Josh is not a Christian. Now it comes out, right? No. That's not how language works. That's not how people communicate, right? Um, so there's, there's more going on than simply an account, uh, uh, accounting for the facts in Scripture. Um, there's linguistic and cultural considerations that must be taken account of. Um, so, for instance, the Bible has metaphor in it. God is a rock does not mean that God is made up of minerals. It's a metaphor, right? So there are times that Scripture uses metaphor. That doesn't mean that it's inaccurate. Number two, there are times that Scripture uses hyperbole. Talk, Paul talks about speaking in the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. He, he's not meaning to communicate there are angelic tongues. He's meaning to say, if I speak in every tongue, every tongue of men and the tongue, even the tongues of angels on top of that. Right? So the Bible can contain metaphor. The Bible can contain, contain hyperbole. The Bible can contain rounded numbers even. So let's look at... Uh, an example here. Uh, I'm going to compare two texts. 
So let's compare Numbers 3, 14 through 15 to Numbers uh, 3, 39. So 14 and 15. Um, and the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, List the sons of Levi by father's house and clans. Every male from a month old upward shall be on your list. Okay, so Moses has to write them. Verse 39, all those listed among the Levites, who Moses and Aaron listed at the commandment of the Lord by clans, all the males uh, from a month old and upward were 22,000. But let's look at verse 33, or 43. And all the first born males, according to them are the names, from a month old and upward were 22,273. Was there an error? No. The Bible rounds numbers sometimes. So it talks about the feeding of the 5,000. Um, if there were 5,271, or if there were 4,937, they I don't know, maybe there were, maybe there weren't. But if there were, that's not an error in the Bible, right? People round numbers sometimes. Um, also, the, the order of some events. The order of some events. So the, the temptation of Christ. The temptation of Christ would be an example. So in Matthew's gospel, you remember the order of the temptations versus in Luke's gospel? So in Matthew's gospel, he moves from the desert to the pinnacle of the temple to the mountain. In Luke's gospel, he moves from the desert to the mountain to the pinnacle of the temple. Right? So is that an error? No. Sometimes the ordering of events um, isn't exactly what happened in history, and it's for theological purposes, right? So Ma what's, what's, Luke probably records the actual ordering, and Matthew probably changes it. And why is that? Because Matthew's comparing one mountain at the beginning of the gospel to another mountain at the end of the gospel, and Luke's not. Matthew's, Matthew's gospel goes to mountains, to valleys, to mountains, to valleys, to mountains, to valleys, back and forth, and in the temptation narrative, which climaxes on a mountain, uh, Satan says, worship me and I will give you all of the kingdoms. That's in contrast to Matthew 28, where Jesus is standing on a mountain and says, all the kingdoms of the world have been given to me. And he, he gets it through his death and resurrection, not by worshiping Satan, right? So, so Matthew is trying to make a theological point. Uh, and so he, he will change the ordering of some events. But that doesn't mean it's not historical. That doesn't mean that there's an error in it. It means that Matthew is trying to make a theological point, and the theological point is the most important thing, right? So, so with that, you, you can't hold, you can't, you can't treat the Bible like it's, um, like it's a newspaper that's coming out today, right? Um, that's not why, that's not the kind of document they're writing. That's not their intention for writing. Um, they're writing a very different kind of document for a very different reason. Um, does that make sense? Any worries about that? So, like, for instance, I read in one, there was an Old Testament survey book that I was reading. Um, we might have it in the back. We might not. It's out of print now. Um, which claimed that um, there's a very, I can't, I haven't done any study to, to know if this is true or not. This, this book was claiming this. That claimed that it's a very common practice in the ancient Near East for people writing their own history to multiply, to multiply the numbers in their armies by 10 to give, to give honor to their God, right? So uh, he was claiming it, it's possible that Israel was doing that. So when they come out of Egypt, the Bible says that there were 2 million people. If Israel was doing that, it's only 200,000, not 2 million. Is it possible that that happened and the Bible would still be inerrant? Absolutely it's possible. Absolutely it's possible, right? They're, they're writing within their cultural construct, and they're not lying. They're, they're, they, they're, their audience would understand, right? That's, a, that's more of a discovering something of their culture than it is them trying to, um, them like lying. They're not lying, right, if that's what they're doing. I don't know if that's what they're doing or not, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't be opposed to inerrancy. Um, so here's the conclusion of that. Scripture is inerrant in all the ways it intends to be inerrant. 
Scripture is inerrant in all the ways that it tends to be inerrant, but that doesn't always mean that it is inerrant in all the ways that we demand it be inerrant. So language and culture matter. Language and culture matter. So can we trust the scriptures? Yes, because the scriptures are true, which we already said. The scriptures are true. God cannot lie, right? We've already said that. And number two, yes, we can trust the scriptures, but we must trust them and understand them within their cultural context. And we must read them within the, with the eyes of the original audience, how they would have understood those words to be read and understood and interpreted. It was written to address a specific audience, and, and our job is to, to sit in the shoes of those audience and try to understand um, what they were trying to communicate. Does that make sense? So it is true. It is without all, it is without heirs, um, and we can trust it. Any other questions on that? Yeah. My, my, here's my best guess is that, um, so a lot of times in the Bible, um, numbers serve more of a symbolic meaning and theological meaning, right? So like numbers like three, seven, ten, even six, um, like they, they, they're, the, there's a numerology behind it that's very significant that we'll talk about a bit in hermeneutics, like what's the, like biblical symbolism and things like that. Um, and those things tend to be much more significant than, uh, than anything else. So for instance, let me, let me just give you one example. Now I don't know, I don't know what the answer is here, but let me just give you an example of where it's just obvious. Um, so if we go to Mark, what is it, nine? Yeah, so the transfiguration happens after six days so the transfiguration happens on the seventh day, right? So it's after six days um, then it happens, which is probably symbolic of the resurrection, right? Because that's when it's gonna, that's when Jesus is unveiled. But why does he mention six and not just say on the seventh day? Um, probably because it's, it's, it's not the fullness of resurrection yet, right? Um, so those kinds, of, those kinds of details are significant in scripture. Um, my guess is it has something to do with that. Peter Lightheart has a commentary back there uh, on Chronicles, and he's really good at that kind of stuff. I would check that out. Um, you'd probably find out in two minutes, and yeah, and you would uh, know a lot about it. Good. Okay. Let me then end with one final thought. Let me end the whole class with one final thought. Uh, and that's, that's the category of sola scriptura in ministry. So this is more of an application point. Sola scriptura in ministry. So we have a book here um, by Matthew Barrett, God's Word Alone, um, that's very good on this topic on, of sola scriptura. Um, sola scriptura means the Word of God alone is our final authority. The word of God alone is our final authority. That, that does not mean, does not mean the scripture is the only source of revelation or even special revelation. It does not mean that scripture is the only source of truth. Um, it does not mean that every verse of scripture is equally clear as everything we've said, but it, it does mean this, that scripture is the final authority um, in our faith and our practice. Um, and do you think about the centrality in the, of the word of God in the lives of God's people, starting from creation, when God speaks, let there be light. God's first covenant with man is made with words. Satan leads God's covenant people astray when he causes them to doubt God's words. Um, God promises the blessing and restoration again through words. Think of the time of the judges. What's the phrase that's repeated over and over and over again in the time of the judges? They did what was right in their own eyes. It's a, it's a pulling away from God's words. Christ then, the true word of God, who in moment of temptation quotes the word of God back to the devil. God's word must be primary 
God's Word, found in Scripture, must be primary. John Chrysostom said this, You have Scripture for a master, is it to his congregation. You have Scripture for a master instead of me. From there, you can learn whatever you'd like to know. You have Scripture for a master instead of me. From there, you can learn whatever you'd like to know. Let me go then to charge you men with what Paul says to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostures will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, right? They will be deceived. They will go from bad to worse. But for you, for you, continue in what you have learned. And wherever has he learned it? He's learned it from the sacred writings. He's learned it from Scripture. Continue in that. Don't, do, do you want to not go from bad to worse? Do you want to have a, a fruitful ministry that ends faithfully? <laughs> Continue in what you have learned. Don't stray. We, we, have enough, we have enough churches in the city that have strayed without you doing the same. Don't, don't do it. There's going to be temptations in ministry um, when, when you think, I will get more people if this happens. And maybe, maybe if, I, if I just, um, I'll, I'll really believe in the truthfulness of Scripture. I'll really believe that the gospel is what people need, but Maybe I'll compromise in this way, in this small little way, just to get enough people in here. And once I get them in, then I'll give them the gospel. Don't do it. Don't do it, because that temptation is going to be there. And, and those, those other people are going to keep growing from bad to worse. They're going to keep deceiving and being deceived. Um, but as for you, um, continue in what you've learned. Continue in the scripture, knowing that you've learned it, from your acquaintance with the sacred writings. They they are able to save you. Your cleverness in ministry is able to save no one. Your relevance to the culture is able to save no one. Your your ability to discern modern trends politically or socially or psychologically, that's not able to save anyone. What's able to save people is the Bible. It's the gospel given in the Bible. And because your words, my words, are not breathed out by God. I will never speak a single word that's breathed out by God. I will never write a single word that's breathed out by God. These words in Scripture are utterly unique. And because of that, they're profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And they're able to make you whole and complete. They're able to make your church whole and complete. They're able to make you as a pastor whole and complete. So trust them. And so, I charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearance and kingdom, to preach the word. Don't preach your own ideas. Preach the word, and be ready to preach the word at all times. Because the day is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. They're going to want something else. They'll turn away. But as for you, as for you, be sober-minded. That idea of sober-mindedness is a pastoral qualification, right? The, 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 the idea behind it is you're, you have, you have, you're not swayed by your emotions. You're not a person of great emotional highs and great emotional lows. You, you're steady. You're sober-minded so that you can endure suffering. So you can do the work of the evangelist. So you can preach the word of God in season and out of season. And so you can fulfill your ministry. That's my, that's my final charge to you, men. If, all, if, I could, if I could challenge you with any one thing, and it's obvious, of course. If I could challenge you with any one thing from this course, be men of the word. Be men of the word. Don't stray from it. You will be tempted to. You will be tempted to. Don't do it. And Christ is with you. In in the preaching of the word of God, Christ himself is preaching through you. Trust that word.